Hi, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Dr. Cybersecurity. I'm Dr. Mansoor Hasib, and this evening, my first guest is from India, Anushka Lal. Please introduce yourself. Hello, hello, sir, and greetings to all the viewers. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you, sir, for your huge achievement on winning the 2020 People's Choice Award in Cybersecurity and the 2020 Champion of the Year Award from Maryland Cybersecurity. Wow, Hello, thank you very everyone. Much. <laughs> I am Anushka Lal. I would like to apologize beforehand if I happen to make any mistakes along the way, because this is my first time talking at a huge platform like this. In fact, I'm really nervous right now, but hopefully it will go well. Uh, I am originally from Nepal, but uh, right now, I'm pursuing my undergrad in computer engineering in India. I have just recently began exploring the field of cybersecurity, and my interests greatly align towards deployment of machine learning and AI in the field of cybersecurity. I would also like to mention one other reason that I'm here today is to allow myself to develop my communication skills. Sir, I was watching your past conversation videos and I came across one where you shared your experience from Toastmasters. You might not really believe this, but that video really clicked me. And then I was like, I have to do this. Being an introvert, like public speaking has always been my greatest weakness. So thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to talk on this platform. Wow. Yeah, you say you're a shy person and you're an introvert, <laughs> but that was one of the most awesome introductions I've ever heard on this show. So you were smooth, you were articulate, and you had some great thoughts over there that showed the personality behind the person. So I love that office room or whatever you have back there. What is that? <laughs> that, that looks beautiful. <laughs> That's a virtual background, actually. How wonderful. Look at that. Look at that. That is wonderful. <laughs> All right, so Toastmasters got you very interested. So is that one of the things that you want to talk about, like personal branding, public speaking? Certainly, it's one of the most important things in life. As you probably know from my background, I used to be in Toastmasters from 1991 to 1994, and that's where I got rid of my, ooh, uh, um, you know, all those things. I left them behind. And then I launched this career, became a professional public speaker and everything, but then things changed, and I saw the world champion of public speaking. And that speech was so amazing. And I noticed so many things has changed in the last 25 years in the world of public speaking that I figured that I need to go back and update my skills because you got digital now, you got all kinds of sound now, you got props, you got almost theatrics in public speaking. And almost every public speaker also has to inject some humor because uh, it, it's, it's almost become an entertainment, right? So I went back last year and started updating my skills. Oh my God, I've been having a time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what questions do you have, Anushka? Uh, yes, sir, sir. Since I mentioned, like, I am greatly interested in the AI and ML field uh, of this uh, cybersecurity. So my questions will be uh, aligned towards that field direction. So starting off, uh, with AI and ML progressing their way into the field of cybersecurity, like we have been introduced to this new technology of deep fakes. Like uh, they are capable of generating realistic looking fake images, videos, and audios. Mm -hmm. But recently we have been uh, terming it with the word weaponization. Mm -hmm. So what exactly are we referring it? Why are we suddenly calling it as a weapon? Because they were originally developed to bring a whole new positive impact to the humanity, right? Right. Well, if you think about any kind of technology or weapon in the hands of criminals, that same weapon can be turned into a criminal weapon. A gun, for example, normally was for hunting and protection, but it, has, it is also used for crime. So, Similarly, technology of any kind, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever it might be, even news 
has been weaponized, as you can see, and it is much cheaper, as you can see also. It's much better than throwing bombs and all that. It's very, attribution is very difficult and things like that. So this is a completely new field. I mean, the next war, and we are actually already in it, is in the information and the cyberspace. It's not really going to be nuclear weapons. Yes. So, sir, like, um, considering the scale of today's online platforms, don't you think, like, social media platforms should step up to prevent against this? Yes, absolutely, because they should be viewing themselves as media. They are the modern media. So, for example, the traditional media platforms, the newspapers, whatever they were, used to have journalistic standards. Now, part of the problem is that in this new world, the laws and all of those things, the rules and regulations have not been developed yet. We are way behind, and that's because most of the lawmakers and the people who make these laws are from a different generation, and they're really not up to date with what is going on. And the other thing that has happened is that in the past, as the executives changed or the lawmakers changed, technology's pace of change was slower. Right now is geometric. So that's a big problem. And you can see, I mean, we, we go see that many of the people that are in positions of power today, when you talk to them about anything related to digital, they really don't understand it. And the typical executive preparation programs do not deal with them. So that's another serious problem, which is part of the reason that, that you keep people like, that you keep seeing people like me passionately talk about that the need to update education. That was part of the reason that I came to academia, because academia is seriously broken. Many of the yes. MBA programs have not been updated in the last 40 years. That is almost criminal. So, sir, like, don't we need to prepare ourselves for these laws? Because as technology progresses, like, these problems can get serious. Over time. Not necessarily laws, so there are technical solutions. As you can see, Facebook, Twitter already has started to flag things, right? This is one of the things that I was talking with my students even as back as 2013, 2014 when I first started teaching. Because I told them, this is the wave that's going to come. There will be lots of fake news and deep fakes and all these things. And then the very people who are producing the fake news is actually going to deflect and say, oh, the, all the truth news are the fake news and things like that. So we needed, we needed vetting mechanisms so that something that is truly fake is immediately stamped fake by some authority. If the, if the journalism, if the media people themselves are not going to do it, so, for example, if Facebook themselves are not going to do it, well, then somebody else has to do this. For example, the reputational newspapers. I'm sure you have them in India. I know we have them here. Some of the very, very reputational ones are so fanatic about making sure that they are vetting every story, that they're verifying all the sources, and two, three types of verifications before they will publish everything. And then when an incorrect story or a bad story has been published, sometimes people have been, what do you call, held, held accountable and they've lost jobs and things like that. Well, that also needs to start happening in the new media because nowadays platforms like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, all of these things have become micro-learning, micro-platforms for news. And so when people are sharing, resharing fake stuff or incorrect stuff, they absolutely need to be flagged. And if the people are not flagging it, then people like you. The, the, these are all business opportunities as far as I can tell. That is what I yes. encourage the, the students, the researchers to, to do this. So you should look at it lastly, as a business sir, opportunity. Will... <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Sir, lastly, I would like to ask some personal career counseling questions. Okay, there, absolutely. If you allow me to. Absolutely. Yes, Any you, question is fine. Uh, um, 
As a computer science student, like what do you think is my scope in this field? Or if I were to like pursue masters in cybersecurity or information security, how would you suggest I prepare myself for this transition? Like as a because in the field of computer science, it's mostly about just coding. So if I were to transition to cybersecurity, how would you uh, suggest? Well, very first thing I would recommend is in India, my book, Cybersecurity Leadership, is right now available for 49 rupees, the ebook. Read that from first page to the last page. That would be your best investment because you really need to understand what cybersecurity is. Because you talked about cybersecurity and information security almost synonymously, and they're not. Information security is a very old field. And in my opinion, it doesn't exist anymore, even though the people that used to practice that still think that cybersecurity is information security. Information security is a very static field. It never had the concept of time in it. And my book actually talks about that. The information security model was first established in 1991. Then in 2001, the concept of time got added in and the information assurance field came into being. These are all things that I studied during my doctoral program. So this is another reason you talked about studying a master's degree in say cybersecurity or information security. Well, the two are completely different. A true master's in cybersecurity will involve people, policy, and technology, all of those aspects. It would have mission focus because a cybersecurity strategy for a healthcare organization or an educational organization is going to be radically different because you will never have this exact same strategy for two different organizations. Because our first job is to make sure that the organization is successful. So you have to think like a business professional. So think about a true modern cybersecurity program as the better executive preparation program of this modern era. Because an MBA program is not preparing people to be an executive today. So this is why when I designed my programs, I had to include all of the business principles into it. I had to include the risk management principles into the mission, the people, the governance, culture, all of those things. So if you go to ask a typical CEO, how do you run your company? They will say culture, because culture defines the behavior of any company. And then culture starts with values. So these are all concepts that are explained in my book. That will introduce okay. you to cybersecurity. Now that you understand that, when you vet an academic program, you'll be able to ask them, what is your definition of cybersecurity? How do you view cybersecurity? If they go to computer science, you know that that's not the right program for you. You see? Computer yes, science is completely yes. different. You're absolutely correct. It is all about coding. It is all about doing the hardware and the software, and that's what computer science is, which is fantastic. We love it, right? We need those computer scientists. But a computer scientist and a cybersecurity professional are two completely radically different people. I never coded in my life. Did I know how to code? Yes, very, very early in my career, I did learn to code, but it was not something that was for me. I was always a strategist. I was seeing how do I use technology to drive the mission of these modern organizations. So that was what I was spending my time on. So I converted nuclear power plants, for example, from the paper to a digital era. I converted hospitals, converted healthcare organizations, biotechnology, education, all of those things. So I learned that the basic promise of technology is what? To make that organization successful, right? So that is what a true cybersecurity professional does. The protection, the safety, the risk management, that is a given. If you cannot do that, you shouldn't even be in this profession. So that is a given, but it is never the goal. The goal is to make the organization successful, make the organization money, bring in revenue, make it modern, and perpetually innovate. Because if you perpetually innovate, what happens? You can never become obsolete. You'll never go out of business. But if you stop innovating, you will go out of business. It's just a matter of time. Does that make sense? 
Yes, sir, sir, absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so this you... was absolutely wonderful talking with you. Did you want to say something else? Uh, yeah, you've, uh, you've always been a great host, and today was no different. Also, thank you to all the viewers for your patience and kind attention. And hopefully, I've motivated more students like me to utilize this amazing platform with you. Thank you. You absolutely have. And do tell your friends to come. Everybody is welcome. Nobody has to be an expert. And this is the beauty of this platform. Many people have made their video debut over here. And you can see that it's very easy because all you have to do is ask some questions and be professional. And you can prepare those questions. And you have to do a one to two minute introduction and do your homework, which you did. You watched the videos. You did a great job. So I really appreciate having talked with you, Anushka. I know you're going to have a terrific career. And do come back some other time and do follow my work. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And now Thank I you. am going to bring in my next guest, Brian Abercrombie. Brian, please introduce yourself. How are you, uh, Man Sure, Thank you for inviting me to participate in the conversation this evening. Um, so far, this has been great stuff. Anushka, nice job. Some of the things that uh, you were chatting about with the kind doctor really resonate with, uh, with me. And uh, this was completely unplanned, but some of my dialogue and some of the questions I have are gonna parallel off of that. So um, yeah, more to come. But again, my name is Brian Abercrombie. I'm located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You know, the leaves are changing colors here. The temperatures are steadily dropping. So autumn is in full swing. Uh, I personally have been in the technology field for 25 years and have worked in a wide array of industries, including banking, academia, telecom, energy markets. I've done a lot of professional services and advisory work, and that exposure alone has really helped me to strengthen my business acumen. So. That being said, you know, the vast majority of my experience has been in a leadership role uh, overseeing IT and or cybersecurity, or as you said, mandatory uh, information security, uh, you know, in its older state, um, strategy and teams. So this is something I want to come back to and get some insight here, but uh, just some context. And again, this is this has been my experience, so it's strictly the world according to uh, to Brian, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a time, at least in my experience, again, where InfoSec uh, in an organization wasn't a real focus or discipline. Mm -hmm. um, it was maybe recognized, maybe not. If anything, it was it was a function within IT, and uh, I can remember being in a role where you know it didn't even really have um, real responsibilities to find they were just kind of assumed or behind the scenes mm -hmm. uh, security duties and uh, yeah. i think i think many organizations still function this way um, they do. seems un seems unlikely <laughs> um, but that leads me to to a question you know i just wanted to get some insight you know i got some data points out there i've done some research but you know, from a practical standpoint um, are, are there organizations still out there that don't have formal roles and responsibilities sp specifically focused on cybersecurity? Uh, professional companies, you know, that, that are in some sort of um, professional services business, some, you know, manufacturing. Uh, you know, I opened it up to the group, but wanted to get some insight, of course, in your travels and conversations. Um, Man, sir, I'd like to, to hear what you had to say on that. Sure. No, that was well, wonderful. So thank you for that introduction, Brian. I love your background, too. Is that is that the city that you're in? Yeah, city of Pittsburgh. That's, uh, you know, doesn't look like that right now, but. Uh, beautiful, that's... beautiful. No, so, okay. So you, were, you, you wanted to know what is the landscape out there? Are there companies that are doing it right and companies doing it the old way? and yeah. have evolved or something like that, right? Or is it just still an unrecognized, or how many companies out there are still, you know, doing something around cybersecurity if they haven't done something in a reactive mode right now, but it's, it's, it's we'll call it unofficial off the books. It's, it's, you know, kind of a suppressed job role that's not really, you know, it's just somebody's add-on duties, if you will. 
Right. So my recommendation is always before you study. So this is one of the things I make my students do. I ask students to first look at the org chart of an organization. If the org chart of the organization says that the chief information officer or that whole IT side reports to the chief financial officer, chances are it's not being done right. Mm -hmm. But if they are reporting to the chief executive officer, chances are they do view information technology, information, digital strategy as a strategic asset so that it goes all the way to the CEO level because it is, they view it as a mission driver. The companies that don't view it as a mission driver, chances are very high they're not doing it right. At least that's what my research showed. See, I was one of the few people that actually did a doctoral study where I did a national study of US healthcare organizations. And what I found there was that 50% had that whole area report to the chief financial officer. And that's when I realized, ah, now it makes sense. And the organizations that where the CFO is in charge and the organization where the CEO is in charge are dramatically different. And in many organizations, you will also see the CEO is a former CFO. That is another deadly type of organization. Because that also means that these people are only interested in making money games, budget manipulations, and things like that, and they don't really understand. So I cannot imagine, for example, a typical MBA just with a finance background running, say, an energy company. As a matter of fact, I saw that, and a person like that actually destroyed an energy company. Because what I'm used to seeing are people who live and breathe energy running energy companies. Just like I would expect, expect a healthcare professional to be running a healthcare company. If I see, say, a typical CFO type running a healthcare company, that would give me the creepies. Yeah. You see, so this is the problem. What has happened is we have generic CEOs, generic CFO types running massive companies today. These are the people that also brought in the layoff culture because they don't understand that people actually always produce more than what we pay them. So people are never an expense. But these people in the accounting system, they have learned that people are the biggest expense in any company. That's what they are taught. That's yeah. what they've learned. So therefore, <laughs> they only look at people as a cost center. Cut, cut them off, lay them off, guess what? They feel like, oh, I've saved so much money on the Excel spreadsheet. But they forgot that the revenue that that person was producing is not reflected in the spreadsheet. That accounting system is from the 1500s. That's a very good point. And, you know, from an org chart standpoint, that's certainly a telltale sign as to how the organization may treat cybersecurity or IT for that matter. Yes. Um, you know, one of the things I've seen on both sides of the, the table, you know, being internal to an organization as well as um, being pulled into some. Uh, advisory services and professional services work is that what is the catalyst for why you do, why you make some investment in cybersecurity? I, I, is it proactive, meaning it's strategic, yes. or is it is it reactive? Um, you know, a lot of times I see it more being more so being reactive. This is this is uh, driven by auditors. It's driven by regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. Something we have to do. Right. Um, not necessarily something we want to do or would do if we you weren't forced to do so. So you, you we're already kind of coming at it from a from a negative approach yep. uh, versus treating it as, um, you know, strategic to the organization, treating it as a potential competitive advantage or 
taking the approach that it's the right thing to do in this in this not even right thing it's perpetual innovation so one of the things that if you read my work i have basically simplified it in one sentence i basically say cybersecurity is people powered perpetual innovation and i stress that people part because it's the people that do the innovation you see yes there's there's a whole bunch model behind it and everything but this is the simplest explanation i've given people because i want them to focus on the innovation and once they focus on the innovation, guess what? It becomes a revenue driver. And that's the way we need to view this discipline. I always practiced it that way. Yeah. So kind of on that same theme, you know, just thinking about the evolution, the advent of the, 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 the CISO role. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's very uh, relevant for me right now as I'm, you know, kind of exploring the market, looking at new opportunities myself, mm -hmm. um, having that IT background, you know, where I've been in an IT leadership role, as well as uh, the cybersecurity leadership role, you know, a lot of organizations that's, you know, all under one roof, uh, one person kind of managing and overseeing that, which, which I like, but that might not be the way that the the industry is going, it might not be the way that things are moving to in the future. I think, you know, historically the CISO position has always been nested within the IT department. So it reports into um, the, the CIO or the senior leader in the IT organization, mm -hmm. um, just like some of the other functions, network, Apple, you know, enterprise applications, network infrastructure, what have you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, that, that certainly has pros and cons, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's good and bad with that, but but I'm seeing a trend now where there's a focus and a shift to decouple that relationship and have that uh, report outside of the IT organization. Um, so, you know, kind of thoughts on that. Maybe we could spend some time, you know, chatting about that a little bit. Some of the things that I've seen and observed, and um, you know, what may make sense. I know the short answer is it is it depends, but. Uh, you know, I've definitely seen the role uh, report into, you know, the board, uh, potentially the CFO, uh, another risk function within, within the organization. Um, so thoughts on that? Yeah, thoughts is that a lot depends on the person. Because at the, at the outset, these executive roles are business roles. They must understand the business. They must mm -hmm. understand that vertical that they are in. Because a healthcare CISO or a digital strategist in a healthcare organization is going to be dramatically different than that same strategist in education. Now, can you transition? You absolutely can. Because it takes time. I have done it. So to give you an example, I used to be a CIO in education and biotechnology. From there, I transitioned to healthcare, but I did that transition with a strategic objective because I noticed that in 2010, around that time, the massive digitization of healthcare was about to happen because the Affordable Care Act was happening in, in the United States. Also, health information exchanges were being built in various states and particularly in the state where I'm a resident in the state of Maryland, there is a robust health information exchange as well as a very robust health insurance exchange. All of these things were happening. The hospitals were getting connected. In some states like Delaware, every hospital is connected. 90, more than 90% of the healthcare providers in, say, the state of Delaware is connected via this health information exchange. So they're actually using digital to improve the quality of healthcare and also reduce the cost. For example, Delaware, they actually reduced the cost of many of the providers and made it one-fifth through this digitization, which I knew was going to happen. So I spent a lot of time understanding what was happening in that space and I became conversant in it. So I think in your case, if you want to transition first, I wouldn't look at the role first. I would look at the sector which you are passionate about. What is the sector that you feel that is coming where you would enjoy working because it's that ultimate mission that you want to guide yourself. 
not right. the CISO role necessarily, CIO role or everything, but where does Brian want to make a difference in this space, you see? So I enjoyed that part. And that is why even in this cybersecurity leadership book, half of the book deals with that healthcare sector, which I was so excited about. No, I, I, I agree with you on that point. And, you know, some of the things that have come up with my conversations and, and, and meetings with various companies um, on looking at these roles that are focused on, you know, IT and or information security mm -hmm. is, um, you know, at times I sometimes feel that, you know, having that broad background in both, regardless of the sector, it, it, it can be a detriment. But what I'm finding out is it's not so much a detriment that I should take stock in and, and kind of, you know, pivot or, or, or reevaluate my you know, career trajectory. I, I think it really comes down to the culture, even though you're looking at the, at the industry, but it's also the culture because, you know, I've, I've looked at certain industries and had some opportunities to get a foot in the door where there was, you know, something ripe for disruption uh, where technology and uh, cybersecurity could be extremely strategic to the, mm -hmm. to the role and to the organization. Mm -hmm. But I, I couldn't get past uh, the gatekeeper, if you will, in the organization that wanted to compartmentalize it into, we really need somebody that's focused on, you know, X, Y, Z, risk management, cybersecurity, and you have that, but you also have a CTO background, uh, IT leadership background. So it's it's too broad. We need somebody who's a little bit more focused. And I-, I You may I, be mentally not there. So you may be mentally above that, you see? And, yeah. and so the people that were interviewing you, maybe you need to be in those kinds of roles and to, to get there, what you would need to be able to do is understand the business. This is why I'm talking about the sector. See, if you can get to network with CEOs, you need to be attending conferences in the sector where you want to be working in. So in order to break into the healthcare sector, I actually visited a lot of healthcare conferences. I met with a lot of healthcare CIOs, CISOs, and I learned the language. So when I interviewed for the head of a healthcare organization, I was able to understand what are the things that would trigger things. So I knew, and, and very simply, because I was talking to a CEO type with an MBA, so I, and, and an MD. So I basically, when she asked me what, what, why should she hire me, and I basically said, I'm going to help her make healthcare affordable and accessible. That's it, those two things. My entire conversation was about making healthcare affordable and accessible. Because I knew those were the words that would resonate with her. And it did. Right. Because that's how because your CEO, that's how they will be thinking. So you need to be preparing yourself for those CEO types of interviews. And many of these interviews are going to happen through networking and stuff like that. Many of these jobs are never advertised. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm learning. So, you know, it's, that is the full-time job that it becomes is just, uh, quite frankly, doing stuff like this, networking. That's how you and I uh, reconnected. I was giving that some thought, you know, um, it took me a, a little bit, you know, to, to kind of recall uh, you and I met many moons ago at a mm. Educause conference. And, ah, uh, that's where it was. Okay. In the uh, in in the Inner Harbor there in uh, Baltimore. Um, uh, you know, I really missed those conferences. Was that 2005 or so? Because that was my first time I think I ever gave a presentation on like a layered information security architecture or something. That was it. And that was it. My God, that's amazing. <laughs> and and we were, you know, and I was in a role where. You know, I kind of, I spoke to that a little bit where I was in a role where I was responsible for, it was in academia, I was responsible for systems engineering and other things. And then uh, as a bolt-on, I was responsible for security as well. So, um, 
I was trying to figure out, well, well, how do we approach this, you know, when when it's one of many duties nested within the IT organization. So um, really great stuff, I recall. We, we, we Yeah, we, it was. I mean, my God, at that time, when I even made that presentation, it was the first time anybody within the University System of Maryland had made that kind of a presentation. Even some of the big universities didn't have that. And I was actually one of the one of the smaller universities. But the difference between me and other people was that I had worked in nuclear power plants, in healthcare organizations, various other places, and I was coming with that background and, and high fault tolerance, high security, high everything, high protection into a biotechnology organization where, my God, I, I mean, all kinds of intellectual capital was there, well, first of all, and second of all, this was global because the Biotechnology Institute had four locations in two different cities, plus they were collaborating with collaborators all over the world. So right. it wasn't like I had a perimeter or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, you were ahead of your time then because- uh, No, but I was teaching. You see, that was the thing. I, I, that yeah. was why I was, I was doing that presentation and actually two universities adopted my model right after that within the University System of Maryland. Oh, wow. I was very happy. Yeah, so my thing was always empowering others. I have never felt like sharing my knowledge ever reduces my knowledge. As a matter of fact, I feel like it becomes more refined. So the two universities that actually wanted to implement my model, I shared everything with them. I shared my documents with them. I shared my audit reports and everything with them. So it actually turned out to be very nice collaborative relationships also. Yeah, absolutely. Now that's great stuff. All right, well, this has been absolutely amazing. Nice catching up with you, Brian. I wish you Likewise. the best. I think that you should be like researching sectors, writing blogs, talking about it so that your brand in that space starts to grow. And then hopefully it leads to some conversations which will then lead to your right opportunity. So yes, you're 100% correct, it is a full-time job. And now we can go into the networking portion where anybody can talk. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you.